thank you very much to to the organizers for for inviting me to to talk at this very special conference and uh and i'd like to be the first to to wish gilles a bon anniversaire uh rather delayed um it's been a tough year for all of us and and i look forward to a time when we can all get back together in in person uh so uh this this talk is about some work which a phd student of mine oliver sheridan medvin uh did and you know finished up just a few months ago and um and as in so much of my research it's connected with multi-level monte carlo and in this case using approximate distributions let me So that's that's the overview. Uh, let's just skip that. So obviously, starting with just plain Monte Carlo, we just average n independent samples. And if we want to achieve a root mean square error of epsilon, the number of samples is approximately epsilon to the minus two times the variance. And if each sample costs C, then the total computational cost is approximately epsilon to the minus two VC. A two-level Monte Carlo, um, sorry, let me just, a two-level Monte Carlo, if we have a quantity P tilde approximately equal to P, then we can do this simple uh, expression for the expected value. We use the two levels, we have N0 samples for the approximate quantity P tilde, N minus one samples for the difference between the true P and the approximate P. If the cost of the uh, P tilde is C0, and then we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have C1 as the cost of the difference, then we have this expression for the cost of the estimator, the variance, if we use independent samples, the variance is the sum of the variances of the two parts, and each of those parts, it's proportional to one over the number of samples. And so then we can do a constrained optimization, minimizing the cost subject to the same overall root mean square accuracy of epsilon, and that gives this expression for the total cost. And just to put some numbers to this, if P tilde, the approximate P, has a tenth of the cost of the regular P, and the variance for the correction, V1, is 10 to the minus three times the original variance, then we end up approximately with a factor eight savings compared to the original Monte Carlo. Okay, so that's just a very simple example. Multi-level naturally extends that uh, to a whole sequence of levels. And in this context, usually using some sort of geometric sequence. And in the case of an SDE, then using two to the L time steps on level L is, is you know, the common thing to do. We get our usual multi-level estimate and the total cost ends up with an expression uh, of that form. And that then leads to the usual multi-level theorem, which I can skip through because there's nothing, nothing new there. Okay. So in this work, we were interested in what happens when generating the random numbers is a significant computational cost? Um, and looking at what we could do to use an approximation to those random numbers. You know, so taking random numbers from a slightly incorrect distribution, and that's going to correspond to the P tilde that I had in the two level method, okay? Um, so we were particularly thinking about sort of more complicated 
distribution, such as the non-central chi-squared distribution that comes up in the context of the CIR model in finance um, or, or you know, Heston stochastic volatility. Um, but this, this work was primarily looking at normal random variables on the basis that we stood a chance of doing the numerical analysis to actually analyze uh, the effectiveness of, of, of this. And looking at approximate normal random variables, this is something that's been looked at uh, previously by people like Klaus Ritter and, and his team, um, particularly using quantization methods. And so it's so building on, on, on that existing work. And, and in this context, I just want to mention that, of course, one of the natural ways of generating uh, a, a scalar random variable X out of some distribution is to first generate a uniform random variable on, on the zero one interval, and then define X as being the inverse of the CDF function applied to, to that uniform random variable. And so that's, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be approximating the inverse normal CDF function to generate approximate normal random variables. So the very simplest example then is an euler mariama approximation of an SDE. Um, so here we have uh, square root of H and time step times Zn, uh, a unit normal random variable. That's giving us our sample of of the Brownian increment for the time step H. Okay, and so the standard method, we would be defining ZM as being uh, the inverse normal CDF function applied to this uniform random variable UM. And what we're instead going to do is use approximate normals with Q tilde being an approximation to, to phi inverse. That will be much cheaper to, to evaluate and that's what's going to lower the computational cost of generating the approximate path using the approximate normal in P tilde at the end. We were looking at three different uh, approximations uh, motivated to, to some degree by different computer hardware. So one approximation, this is very much building on you know, the earlier work and analysis by, by Klaus Ritter and colleagues, was a quantized approximation where we take the unit interval, break it up into two to the D subintervals and treat phi inverse as being piecewise constant as an approximation on that. This means that in practice, what you need is, is a D digit random integer, and then it's just a direct lookup table, you know, that you, you have an array of these uh, constant values and the random integer with D digits uh, gives you the index of the lookup table. So on, on the left, we, we have an illustration there. I think it's got 16 intervals. Uh, on the right, we've got the error moments of the difference between Z and Z tilde. So this is for the same uniform random numbers, you know, applying either the quantized approximation or the true normal CDF inverse. So these are the error moments and showing the way that they, they decay as we increase the number of subintervals. So for the, for the computations, we use D equals 10. So that's uh, 1,024 subintervals. That size of lookup table sits very nicely within the level one cache in, in a CPU. And so that's a very rapid lookup process. The next uh, one that we looked at, and this is sort of my favorite really, 
is, is a piecewise linear approximation. And rather than doing it on uniform intervals, uh, doing it on dyadic intervals, meaning that the intervals get smaller as you approach the singularities at zero and one. Um, so here on the left, we've got it with just, well, that's actually four segments uh, there. But you know, as soon as you go to well, 16 or so, you know, visually, you can hardly tell the difference from the true phi inverse. Um, so it really is a, a very effective approach. On, on the right again, we see the decay of the error moments as we increase the number of subintervals. It's noticeable that the fourth moment comes down much further than the second moment. If I go to the previous one, um, the second and fourth moments with the quantized are very much dominated by the errors in the, the pieces right at the two ends, you know, the, you know, the very poor approximation of the singularities at either ends. That's what's responsible for the, the decay of the error moments. Whereas with the piecewise linear with the, with the dyadic intervals coming smaller at the two extremes, uh, the fourth moment comes down a lot better. This approach is particularly good on CPUs with a vector length of, of 32 or more, because now the, the lookup table can actually be held within a vector register. And in fact, I think this is what Intel uses in, in their own mathematical library software. Um, so extremely rapid for, for this vectorized treatment. And it, it may seem that this is a bit tricky using the dyadic intervals, you know, shrinking by factors of two into the corner. But actually, if you take a uniform random number, you know, for the first half of the interval from zero to a half, then taking the normal uh, floating point representation, you just look up the exponent of the floating point representation, and that tells you which of the dyadic intervals you're in. So again, this is very fast to implement. And then, you know, the third option is a classic least squares polynomial approximation. It really isn't very good. The, the error moments decay very slowly with polynomial degree, again, because of the difficulty with the singularities at either end. Um, but, but for a GPU, which is one of my other interests, uh, you know, that, that's a good treatment for the GPU in half precision. Okay, so how do we then use that? Well, very simply with, with the two level method that if we have a fixed number of time steps, then you know, we simply do one set of calculations using the approximate normals, and then a second set of calculations looking at the difference between the true normals and the approximate normals. Uh, and if the quantity of interest that we're after is simply a function of the terminal state of the path, and this is for a Lipschitz function f, then the variance of the difference is of the same order as the variance of the difference between the true normals and the approximate normals. And so as long as our, our variance of that difference in normals is very small, and the evaluation of the approximate normal inverse Q tilde is much cheaper, then we obtain significant savings on the, on the order of that factor eight that I talked about previously. But you know, we don't just want to do this for a fixed number of time steps. You know, we want to get the benefits of doing this in combination with our standard time-stepping multi-level Monte Carlo. So what do we do to, to handle that? Well, we use nested multi-level. So we start with our standard multi-level expression for doing the time-stepping multi-level. Okay, so 
all of the p hat quantities on that first line correspond to path simulations using true normal random variables. And then going to you know, the combination of the second and third lines, what we've done is to replace each of the p hat terms by the corresponding p tilde term plus the difference between the p tilde term and the p hat term. So on the courses level, you know, we end up with that simple natural two level multi level. And on the finer levels, we end up with this expected correction using the approximate normals plus this expected four way correction. So with a combination of paths, both fine and coarse, and with true normals and approximate normals. And the key thing is that when doing this four way difference, we're generating the approximate paths in exactly the same way as the, the, the regular p hat paths. All we're doing is for the same underlying random variables um, replacing zm by the approximate z tilde. So it's a very straightforward thing to implement. So numerical analysis. I, I don't have the time to go through the detail of this, but we, we were able to you know, really fully analyze this. So we, we have the usual strong convergence result that for the paths using true normals, the difference between the coarse and fine path is, order, is of the order of the square root of the time step. Um, the same is true for the approximate paths using the approximate normals. Um, you know, it's a slightly non-standard analysis, but you, know, you would expect that to carry through. Also for paths on the same level, the difference between using the true normals and the approximate normals, as, as I said before, that scales like the square root of the variance of the difference between the true normals and approximate normals. And then the one that was harder was the four-way difference. And so for that four-way sort of cross difference, uh, that scales approximately as the product of these things. So the square root of the time step times the square root of the variance. And you know, for those familiar with multi-index Monte Carlo, that's what you would hope to get is, is that product representation for the error. More precisely, what, what, what the theorem proves is that for any Q greater than two, the root mean square uh, value of that four-way difference is bounded by a constant times the square root of the time step times the, the qth moment of the difference between z and z tilde to the power one over q. Following that result for the evolution of the path, then if we have a smooth payoff function f of x, then we get this corresponding expression for the variance of that four-way difference. Uh, if, if it's a not, not a smooth function, then particularly in looking at the case of financial put call options, where it's continuous and piecewise smooth, uh, the analysis got a whole lot nastier. The numerical results indicate this, this expression, you know, the minimum of these two, two terms h to the half times the variance, or h times the square root of the variance. Uh, but the best that we were able to prove is this slightly com rather complicated looking expression at, at the bottom there. Um, and even, even getting to that expression was, was, was fun. So looking at numerical results, um, here we have the baseline calculation, this is the variance of the multi-level correction 
And it, it's either the correction between you know, coarse and fine paths using the true normals or coarse and fine paths using the approximate normals that to, to a visual level, you can't tell the difference between those two. And then these ones below are the variances of the four-way corrections using polynomial quantized and dyadic approximations for the normals. And so things, things decay very nicely. And there's a large level of savings here. You know, so here, here we've got the variance, you know, several orders of magnitude smaller than the baseline. And so we get good savings. I, I forgot to say that this is in the case where f of x is just x. When we go to the case relevant to put and call options, this is where you see a slight change in the slope in the numerical results. And so that's what we're showing up in, in the analysis. Um, we're also interested in doing reduced precision arithmetic. Um, so, you know, chips these days, you know, I, 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 I had discussions, arguments almost with, with people in, in the finance sector about, you know, why do they bother doing everything in double precision? You know, because, you know, given, given the accuracies involved in, in Monte Carlo estimation, um, going with double precision rather than single precision really makes no sense at all, I would, I would say. Um, and with, with single precision, if you're using vectorization on modern CPUs, you know, that's twice as fast as double precision. Well, now with, with GPUs, we, we have the option of going to half precision. Uh, so 16-bit floating point representation and that's twice as fast again as single as single precision. Um, so I'm I'm interested in in the opportunities that that, that gives for uh, speed ups, but then trying to understand what are the you know the sort of costs in terms of accuracy. But here, what we can do is we've already got the built-in sort of self-correction of multi-level to correct for the accuracy implications. So what we can do is to use single precision for calculating p hat, because I think that's perfectly sufficient. Um, but then for the p tilde simulations, we can use half precision for that and gain an additional factor two in, in performance. So we, we, we've yet to do those, those GPU simulations, but that's, that's the motivation. And you know, you know, we can incorporate that into the, the analysis. I would say that the averaging process should be done in double precision in both cases, because if you're averaging over a very large number of paths, you can get a significant accumulation of round off error if you're doing that in single precision. So you can model the effect of that half precision arithmetic as being an extra error term. So this term on the right, delta times uh, x tilde times uh, vm. So these vm are unit variance random variables. Um, delta for half precision would correspond to you know, the, the floating point accuracy of roughly 10 to the minus 3. Um, so the effect of that rounding error, which you can model as being as a randomized zero mean rounding error, uh, leads to this additional variance term of order delta squared over h. Divided by h, because the more time steps you have, the more accumulation you have of this uh, rounding error. Um, so if that variance gets too large, then it's best not to use the, the reduced precision. So on very fine levels, it, it may be best for them to be done just with single precision. But on the very coarse levels, which tend to be where the dominant cost is anyway, uh, well, certainly if you're using a Milstein approximation, then reduced precision is, is perfectly effective there. Um, 
just a comment at the top of the slide there that you do have to be careful to perform the computations sort of perfectly consistently between the p tilde and the p hat minus p tilde so that you do get the proper multi-level cancellation between the two p tilde expectations you know so there, there, there are some subtle issues there in implementation that you have to make sure that the way the code gets compiled it doesn't end up doing operations in a different order such that the rounding error is different for those two p tildes. Okay, so you know, just to say that you know, in in this work, we've used used nested multi-level. It's similar to multi-index Monte Carlo, but it's more general. Um, I, I I can explain more about that if anyone would like me to in in the questions. Um, and this, this nested multi-level setup, I think uh, works very nicely in you know, bringing in this ability to use approximate distributions to get additional computational savings and reduce precision arithmetic. And so I think it, in some situations that this can be beneficial. Um, so in future, I think the, the, the significant computational cost savings come from extending it to more complicated distributions. But in those cases, I suspect doing the numerical analysis will be extremely difficult, if not impossible. Uh, so one of, one of the motivations was this non-central chi-squared distribution, which comes from doing an exact approximation of, of the, CR, the CIR process. And Oliver did, uh, in, in his thesis, do some preliminary numerical work on, on that. And, and that was using a, a sort of generalization of the uh, piecewise linear dyadic interval approximation. Um, but in, in, for that distribution, you end up having to do a 2D approximation of it. And you know, that, that, that piecewise bilinear approximation you know, works very nicely as a way of generating the approximate random variables. Um, we've, we've not yet looked at extending this to multi-level QMC, but in principle, that should be straightforward. Okay, so uh, these are, are the references, you know, earlier work by Klaus Ritter and colleagues that I, I, I also, you know, participated in a bit. Um, we have an archive paper uh, that's been been submitted now, and Oliver's uh, thesis is is also available, so I can provide that to anyone who's who's interested. Okay, so I I, I finished up early to leave some time for for questions if if, if there are any. I've I've also got a few extra slides if, if if people want to see them, but I think I'll I'll open it up to questions there. Thank you.